but I am also a professor of pathology in the medical school. I'm an ACM fellow. Uh, I actually worked in the industry for 20 years before I become a professor. And uh, I guess 25 years ago, I founded this company, Molecular Connections. I'm very proud of that. It's a company that has grown just over 400 times since I started it. And uh, of course, it's considered one of the best uh, SME in the healthcare technology sector in India. Uh, but I am most proud of it, uh, it because in recent years, uh, it is considered to be one of the best company for women to work for in India. Uh, I think currently probably about two thirds of the company is women. And at half of every level of management is also women. So, uh, well, I, I think each of you should find a girlfriend and bring here. I don't have to do this so long. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> uh, I work in many things. Uh, I have worked on many things before. And uh, today, since I did, I thought most of you would not be biology or something, so I chose a topic on the principal component analysis, which I, I thought most of you would probably, you know, use it or have, have learned about it. Eh? At least those in Singapore is, is part of the high school syllabus. Everyone knows identity compositions. Uh, right? So I need to remind you what PCA is. Yes, <laughs> You're not from Singapore. <laughs> well, at least the way you, you learn it in school is probably can be explained in just one slide, right? So you, you have a matrix and uh, you compute some mean vector of the, of the matrix and you center it. Then after that, you apply eigen decomposition to get the eigen vector V. And the eigen vector V has as many components as their features, but usually people don't use all the components. They only pick some components to use, and then they will project the original matrix or center matrix according to this PC to get into the, the the projection space, and of course, and you can invert it easily, right? So, for example, this is the original two dimensional space, and PCA will find the major direction of variations, right? So, this is obviously the, the major direction of variations, and if you, uh, that means this will become your first axis, right? Then, 90 degrees so it will be the second axis, yes? And you can say, I know I want to keep only principal component one, that means it becomes like this. Yeah. We convert it back to the original. The second dimension will disappear and you only retain the values in the first dimension. Yeah, So that's a uh, PCA. At least uh, you can explain in, in one slide uh, if, you, if, you, if you study the it before. Uh, but really, if you forget the math, yeah, only think about what PCA really means. Unfortunately, when I learned in school, uh, I never told me what it really is. And when I went to university and had to use PCA, also the professor never told me. And I guess uh, I also inspected some of my colleagues here when they taught PCA. Graphics. They also never told the student what PCA really is. Uh, so I will fill that gap today. PCA really, 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 really? Uh, is it's just a deconvolution of the variation in your data into hopefully dimensions or directions that are meaningful. That is all it is doing. Let's figure out what direction of variation is there in your data, right? So PC number one is the biggest variation, right? And then PC number two is 90 degrees to that. And it's the second biggest variation, and so on and so forth. So that is what PCA is doing. And it is all that you can remember. And uh, so now that you know what it is, just to make sure. So here is some example, right? I have a table of purple. 
male turtles and female turtles, and I recorded the shell of the turtle. How long, how wide, how high the shell is. Yeah? So this is the data. And uh, then to see what the data is telling me, I apply a PC on that matrix. And this is what I get back. I'm just showing you the first two principal components. The first principal component accounts for 98% of the variation in the data. The second principal component accounts for 1.4%, and there's also a third component because I have three variables, right? Length, width, and height. That's why I should get three principal components. I'll show you in the two. And the first principal component, uh, you can see the correlation with the length, width, and height. Is very common, actually, yeah. So, what does the first principal component mean? What does this variation along the first principal component mean? Any intuitive idea? Size, yeah. They correspond to size because height, uh, width, and all that is size. They correspond to size or more intuitively. It actually corresponds to the age of the turtle because the turtle keeps growing. So the size is directly correlated with the age of the turtle. So that is what it is. And what is the principal component two? It is stop. Not that correlated with any of those, but the same correlation negative and positive. This is very interesting. When you see positive negative correlation, that means access explaining something very interesting. And it actually, um, um, for lack of a better word, it corresponds to the distortions of the shape of the purple shell. Okay? How exaggerated the type is because the length of this is negative and the top is positive. Yeah? <laughs> so you can see that uh, once you look at the formula, you can try to interpret what it means. And then, of course, you can try to have some way of. Uh, so, you know, if I know it's H, right? One is size or age, so I can certainly see whether I get if I get the age of the turtle, right? I can see whether that age is well correlated with the value of PC1. Okay. <clears throat> so it gives you that meaning, and in particular, if I now project my table of the turtles onto my first two PC, I'll get this, this chart. And uh, in the chart, I think the black dots are female, the white circles are male. It's in Italian, so it look a bit funny, but yeah, black dot is green. So what can what can you see straight away? Females are bigger, right? Because PC1 is the size, right? So you can see that female is bigger, and maybe female is older, p the female also has more saturated height of the shell. So you can, you can tell, you can, you, you can see the meaning of the data more or less straight away. Once you know how to interpret your principal components, uh, this is what we mean by PCA, we convolute the variation into meaningful direction. But of course, that meaning you have to figure out what it is. Okay, so uh, intuitively that is what PCA is. Um, oh. This is just the slide I took from our graphics class. Um, this is what they taught, and they were teaching you exactly those formulas that I show you. And then in the end, what is very interesting is that after they taught, yeah, my meeting taught what is PCA and how to do it, he never mentioned about the convolutional in the military direction. And at the end, of course, they will show what they want to use a PCA for. And it says dimension reduction. You know what is dimension reductions? Yeah, you have too many variables, want to pick up a few that is more meaningful. Yes. And uh, apparently, that is what a typical class on principal component will do. These are all the algebra, and the purpose is dimension reduction. And indeed, if you go to the Wikipedia and check, you know, type in Wikipedia PCA, and you'll find it will tell you PCA is. Use for dimensionality reduction. That is why it tells you. It never tells you is convoluting data into meaningful direction. 
Because it allows complicated mathematical operations so that you can do dimension. Is that what, what you are taught? Or is that how you, how you use what you use PCA for? Yes. No. Have a usage. Okay, so let me show you what you can do with your PCA. Uh, I show you by example. Here's another method table, um, on the columns are basically cities. In the center of Italy, on the rows are other European cities. Yeah, and the numbers are basically the distance of this European city to this various city in Italy. I'll show you some example. This is Rome. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, Spain and all this stuff, right? All this other so what kind of information do you think is present in this table? What information is there in this table? The first one will be very easy to answer because it's obvious. So what, what, what information is there in this table? This time. Is there any other information in this table besides the name of the cities? The distance of the Italian city from each other. Uh, uh, I guess you can you can infer that. I can find you and calculate that. Uh, it's not explicitly in this paper, but yes, that information is possible to do. Right? Mm -hmm. But it's still distance. So anything else is in this table. Maybe if you don't look at that paper, you look at this map. What information is it in this map? Besides the name of the page. Uh, yeah, okay. What else? Very rich, I have many information. <coughs> you? Angle. Uh, yeah, relative orientation. Yeah. So, uh, this table, I guess, they can't tell you the size of different countries because it doesn't even have the notion of country in there. <laughs> Does it have any information about? orientation and angle that is present in the map. What do you think? Not sure. Can tell. All right. Let's see. Let's try to see. So since PCA is going to give me the meaningful direction or meaningful variation of data, it's certainly angle and orientation function. <laughs> Okay, so I run the PCA on that matrix, and these are the uh, five balance cities, so I get five Facebook components. And Facebook component one, this is the correlation to uh, different European city to the uh, uh, The value of a European city for the PC one is 99% correlated to the distance of the city to go. Yeah, and it's 99% correlated to this city, uh, to this Italian city for personal and so on. Okay, so number one, PC1 corresponds to, quite clearly and obviously, distance to the Italian city. Okay, and it actually accounts for 99.65% of the variation. Not more than 99 percent, huh? so the the remaining principal component is only for less than half a percent of the variation. So if you are doing dimension reduction, that means all this is less your noise, huh? you will throw away right, you won't select them. All right, yeah, uh, I forgot to highlight that this is what, what people do. And the two feature selection. So we look for something that account for further amount of variation and everything else control. Well, that's dimension reductions. So according to that, all these other principal components will be useless because they know information. Yes. And therefore, that table, if that is what you believe, will have only information on distance to Italian cities. No other information. Right? Well, I don't know. 
if I look at that table, I just now someone asked me about distance between Italian city, and I say I know it is possible to calculate on that table. And uh, so some triangulation can be done. And uh, we can also triangulate the orientation of different European cities using information in that table. And just to show you, I have projected the European cities through their principal component two and three. And this is what you see. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the map of maybe you are on your own. So can you recognize anything here? <laughs> <clears throat> maybe it's, it's not obvious or because uh, the orientation is a bit off. I can show you if I if I flip this according to this blue line now, let me flip it. So I flipped it. And I put the European map here, and what do you see? This is center time, and then second here, which is here, you see Madrid and Lisbon, city of Spain. So this is where you are. And next, you go a little bit, you see Marseille, uh, Dublin, Calais, um, Paris, and so on. Right? So you see here. And next, over here, you see. Hamburg unit or this German city, like right. right. Further away, you see uh, Vienna, Budapest, Asta. So these are here, right? This is Vienna, this is Budapest, and then Asta. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and uh, what do I have next? Uh, Sofia, Istanbul. So further down, next is Bulgaria, that's where Sofia is. Down a little bit, Istanbul in Turkey. Right, go a little bit further over here is Athens. PC two and three is the angular orientation of the European city to cities in Italy. So that information is there. So the PCA gave it to you by magic. Yep. So you have to figure out what the relation is, but in this case, uh, it's two and three give you information. Although uh, you remember two and three has less than half a percent of the variation, right? So that little bit of variation is very, very informative. Yeah, so that feature reduction, uh, dimension reduction, all those uh, features are just you know, as many as we can, up to whatever percent, we will throw away the rest. Uh, we'll throw away this information. Okay. So how the natural next question to ask, and it's also a test for you. So we know that one, this one is distance, two and three is the angle. 4 and 5, but it's 4 and 5. Uh, it also accounts for very little information, right? But uh, we cannot dismiss that uh, because 2 and 3 also very little information. And still meaning for something striking. Now, how about this guy? Is there information in there? What else is in that table? Okay. Yeah, but there's no notion of country, so, so, so we cannot have such. So can, can so my test for you, my test for you, I remember PCA is deconvoluting your data variation in the meaningful direction. That's what PCA is doing. My test for you is how can you use that piece of information of what PCA is doing to tell you whether these two PC contain some useful meaningful variation. How can you start? Or is it possible to start? Actually, you have to figure out problems. So I give you five minutes. You can discuss with each other and see whether you can help. Okay? <laughs> it's only one piece of information you need. PCA, the convolute, 
they time for hopefully meaningful directions. <laughs> Okay. That piece of information is enough for you to design a test, a very simple test. <laughs> Someone help me keep down huh? five minutes. <laughs> And no problem like this, you don't need a big computer or things like that, right? I <laughs> Let's see how smart the AI is. <laughs> Anyone come close to a solution or think you got a solution? You got a solution? Animation. Uh, I mean, my question is not so much about. First of all, is can you tell whether this is what I I hope you know that it's a component analysis. Let's say two components, two variables are equal to one component. For one PC, it will become less zero. So we do not know whether this is less zero or not. Okay. Of course, uh, most people will stare at this formula and say, you know, does it mean something? Before you do that, yes. Trying to restore the data. Uh, so you mean by first of all, this let's say protecting only to these two, and then invert that. Is that what you mean? 
that's possible. So I think I will be uh, you will be able to store the paper uh, yeah, yeah. with some distortion. Yeah, but then you still do not know yeah, because this these two are, are, are accounting for very small amount of English. So if the table has changed a little bit, you may still be because this thing is not that. So you may still not be able to tell. So at least from what you described, you haven't you haven't given me a test yet. You've given me a step, but you haven't given me a, a, a test to decide whether this is qualified is Sum the whole column uh, you mean here. And then what do you want to do? Um but why is that deciding is meaningful or not meaningful? What is the logic? Uh, yeah, but there's, there's no, no, no logic with that law. <laughs> Actually, data science is not so much, maybe it's better than a lot. Analyzing so that you know what is the Maybe, but uh, okay, if I have chance for another call, I will tell you about my opinion of that. <laughs> or, <laughs> my opinion of, of what, what, what people call all this. <laughs> anyway, anyone has a, has a test? Can think of a test? Can suggest a test? No? All right. Yeah, maybe. It's coming in. It's not the correlation. Uh, no, you won't find it much correlation because by definition, they're orthogonal. Not yeah, because that, that is how principal component that, that eigen decomposition is uh, defined. Mm -hmm. So far, nobody see, nobody make use of the definition of what a PCA is. Uh -huh. Yeah, so so I find directions there. So which direction is meaningful or not meaningful? This is supposed to decompose them into direction that are meaningful. But I say if your some of your variables are correlated, that means one of those directions will become flexible or not. It doesn't come back. Not quite. Not quite. Okay, I, I let me. <laughs> yes. Relative? No, 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 no. Because relative testing may make sense in one situation, but another table it may not. Right? So something that is universal. Okay, let me remind you. The PCA is deconvoluting the variation into meaningful direction of real factors. So that means some if some PCA are residual noise, it has no direction. Not all PCA have direction. Because once you have correlated variable, then you create up one PC. Now you will call to know that. Now there's something we can do. Because all you need to do, once you, once you know this, all you need to do is, given the table, I calculate the PCA, and uh, I can also add a little bit of noise to that table. Now, if it is a little bit of noise, it doesn't change any of the direction in the big way, right? You know, I, my, I have hundreds of kilometers, I add a few kilometers, it doesn't change the system that much. It doesn't also change the angle that much. Yeah? So, therefore, after I add noise to the table, and I do a PCA on that table with the noise injected, what would the PC compare to the PC without noise? They will be correlated. Provided that, that PC is meaningful because it doesn't change, that little bit of noise will not change the direction of PC that meaningful. 
So if PC one is listen before at, at, at noise, after at noise, PC one will still be present. So they will be very highly correlated. But on the other hand, if the PC happened to be residual noise, it's Gaussian, there's no direct it will be random. So as a little bit of noise, it will also be random, and that means they will not be correlated. So all I need to do is add some noise, you know, in different ways, and just do PCA after adding noise each time, and then I calculate correlation of before noise and after noise. And those PC that have high correlation before and after noise, that's information. Those PC that have no correlation, that's no information, right? You can derive this logically just from the definition. Yes? No guessing, no whatever. Okay. This is about a computer, computational paper. This your logic. So let's show you. So I have that table. I added noise, and this this one show you how much noise I have. At zero, no no. Up to five kilometers noise. Up to five kilometers. So those num those number distances I just add randomly. Right, one kilometer, two kilometers, and so on. And every time after added noise, I call, I do the PC again, and then I calculate the correlation PC by PC before and after noise. This is what you'll see. Principal component very dominant. The correlation is, is actually ninety nine point nine nine percent. It's the same. But adding is hundred of kilometers, right? So adding five kilometers and up to twenty, the not change. Okay, so you can see correlation is there. You see two and three is anger. The anger can change because if the city is very near, I add a little bit, it can shift bigger. Uh, it, it can shift a bigger distance. If it is far away, then it will not shift so much, so, but it will shift. And depending on how big, how much noise I add, it will shift a lot. So what you will see is that this two and three. Initially, at small distance, does not change anger very much. It's highly correlated. When I add bigger noise, that, that correlation will weaken. Yeah, this is a very classic thing to tell you PC two and three has information. Now four and five, what happened? This is zero, zero correlation. It go up and down a little bit, but essentially no correlation. So I know four and five has no information. Yeah, if I want to do dimension reduction, I know I can throw away one part. It's residual noise and that table, therefore, only has distance and orientation, no other information. Okay? Yeah? No, 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 no feature dialogue, no dimension reduction, whatever. That's what PCA is. Okay, and you, it also tells you that if you want to do dimension reduction, like that. You know, that doesn't mean throw away the PC with low variation or some of that is very important. Ready for another test? <clears throat> okay. That sounds kind of theoretical. Now I give you something practical. How many of you have done video? Uh, no, it doesn't matter. You have some experience in video processing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I then, yeah, you have. Some of you have done. Can you think I'm not doing video? Five, ten years ago, every other opportunity student is doing work on the Now, every other student is alive. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, let me tell you, this is a very famous algorithm for separating background and foreground in the video so that you can do like object recognition and so on, right? You only recognize foreground that you want to you want background. Yeah. Yes, I worked by MIT professor and really over the 20 years I've been used by many people. And um, so if you look at that paper, it will describe their method of doing foreground background separation and then copy up this chunk. Okay, read it and tell me whether it is the logic makes sense or does not make sense. Okay. 
And this is the output, right? This is the original video, and this is the background, and this is the foreground. So, um, <clears throat> in the three minutes, a bit about it. It's good, it's interesting to see the two dimension of that. Yeah, so it's, yeah, basically it take a video and take, you know, uh, get a few frames and then compute a PCA and use that. Uh, when they computed the PCA, they keep the first few dimension, right? So that uh, subsequent processing can work a few more than faster. Okay, so that is what they do. And, uh, so to say that you know moving objects, yeah, uh, because they don't appear in the same place and they're very small, so uh, they should uh, they will not be described by this item thing because it keeps copy pieces. Yeah, so they expect the moving object to be captured in the last UPC or next UPC, not a copy. Copy UPC should therefore be. Back up. Okay. Okay. Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? Is Professor tricking you? <laughs> yeah, so these people and this tool used by lots of people. Huh? What can you do? <laughs> MIT professor. Huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, no, no, it's, it's a video. Oh. Okay. Uh, they, they compute the PCA. The, the whole person. Uh, not, not the whole video. Chinese of the video. <laughs> now, based on the understanding of PCA, is that the convolution of variation in the data in the meaningful directions. And PCA is the most amount of variation. PC, PC1 is the most amount of variation. PC2 is the second most amount and so on. How do you think of, about the logic here? Yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. So do you think it's correct? Yeah, we just found but very major part in MIT professor. Because they learned they didn't learn PCA properly. They learned mechanical part. So the moving objects is changing frame to frame. So it is where the variation is. The top few PC will be the moving objects, not the background. Yeah? Unless, of course, it's in some special movie, you know, the guy is driving uh, in the, and you shoot him next to him, right? And the background will be the one that shows up. But that's a very special situation. Most general situation uh, like this time is not be. And that's why you see that, that this is the background, this is the foreground, it's very bad. Yes? But very bad doesn't mean it cannot be used up. So at least the foreground, you can still roughly see where the object is, so you can still do some boxes. You struggle a little bit, you can see that foreground. <clears throat> um, so everyone got the discussion just now? The first few things do not be the background of this moving object of the program. So here is a proof. This is the original item background program. You can just download and run it on a video. This is one frame of the video. This is for that frame, what the background is reported according to the MIT uh, software. This is the program. 
So yeah, using the top 10 percent. The same software, you check it a little bit, changing one line of code so that it uses the last 10 percent instead of the first 10. You do this one, the same frame, not I mean close to the same frame. This is the background. That's the one. <laughs> okay, convince. First, a little bit of logic and understanding. Yeah. Just, just one line you can work with. So that you got. <laughs> okay, this is if you understand properly what PCA is, then think about what it is. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of people, like including my computer scientists, are very fascinated by what are very complex procedures. We get so excited by the procedure, but they never ask or try to understand what the procedure is going to be. Okay. And then we, uh, because of that, uh, many things are going to be done a lot better, very easily, but they do. Okay. Yeah, and it's surprising. After the people is like more than 20 years old, thousands of people have read the paper and used the paper, cite the paper. So you also tell me that a lot of people just maybe read the title of the paper or download the code you never really read the paper, even though the site is Okay. So uh, but I'm very happy that this was found out. Uh, I gave I gave the talk on this to some colleagues and uh, so one of the colleagues that saw this, yeah, picked it up. He's a video processing person. He remembered the picture. Oh, I don't know why. Why the picture is always slightly different. Okay. Okay. So, well, I've just shown you a few things. Also, previously, I just showed you the last the yeah, PC with very few, how this very few version can be meaningful. And now I'm just showing you the, the top PC, those that are supposed to be meaningful, may not be what you want, may not be relevant. And in real world, actually it happened very frequently. Um, maybe you guys are not familiar with processing some real world physical measurement data. If I'm, for example, if I am, if I am working for, let's say some food, Security assurance. And so today, as a popular technique, if you take a bottle of food, you don't know what it is, you should put in, uh, near infrared through the, the liquid, look at the diffraction spectrum, and then say, oh, you know, it got adulterated or something like that. Yeah, except that you realize that well, that machine, that measure, actually is very sensitive. Uh, how do I describe to you? If I'm measuring, I don't know, a piece of metal rod using a ruler, whether today is 29 degrees or 31 degrees, I get the same reader. Okay? But if I put that piece of rod using a very sensitive nanometer resolution measurement machine, 29 degrees and 31 degrees will show up a change. Okay? And so many of the today's measurements are done using very high resolution measurement. And you see those changes. And those changes, yeah. In fact, even the same machine, same temperature, but different person operating, you can feel. It. Okay, and if you do a PCA on that kind of data, you know, today's machine, yesterday's machine, you see the flip. Okay, and in fact, it's split in PC1. So PC1 is not information that you want to do, PC1 is information that you want to get rid of because it represents. Changes you don't want to see. You, you know, it's like if, I, if I'm measuring something of a fishing, the guy comes to my boat, and if I'm measuring today, or if I'm measuring that's a example, I'm measuring today, or if I do that group to say I'm measuring tomorrow, I get two different numbers. But it's the same patient, same sample. So that difference actually you don't want to see, but because it will affect your analysis. Yes, if I get the two different patients sick, I'm not sick, I measure there's a difference. But the guy that is not sick, I measure today. The guy that is sick, I measure tomorrow. I do not know whether this difference because sick or not sick. 
or because it's just natural to them. So you want to your part. Uh, so you have to you have to think you have to figure out what it costs on to. So so for uh you have to figure out what what it is uh anyway you have you're where the noise is so that you PC A is convenient in the sense. So once you figure out PC one is noise, all you need to do is to project to all the other PC and the button. Then the thing is but once you're very experienced and you automatically you think of all the variation that you don't want to see and then you measure how each of these physical components cor correlates with uh, those things those symptoms you don't want to see okay like data that you measure today and just yeah, I, I project them to pc1 see whether pc1 split them in the two group if you split them then i know pc1 is Explaining the first of measure to them. Yes. So I can do that. But yeah. identify what the possible unlanded variation and determine which physical component corresponds to them so that I can get in a post physical component and keep the remaining. Right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so I think I can end here. The learning points for you is the PC is not fully algebra, it's very convoluting. We have variation in meaningful directions, and, but the PC that corresponds to a very low amount of variation may not be not meaningful. And I showed you a way to how to test for that. And the top principal component, although it corresponds to real variation, but that variation may not be what you want to analyze. It's something that you want to take off. Right. And most importantly, the computer scientist, you have logical thinking, deeply great training into you, and uh, yeah, no try your luck this, try your luck that. Okay, everything needs some logic before you try. I think that little bit of thinking can change your result dramatically. Okay. Thank you. Any uh, questions? Yes. How have you used it? Different ways. Uh, so my favorite use is to identify which, what are the variations that I don't want to see. How do I get rid of them easily? So that is uh, one of my favorite views of it. So it's a bit like dimension reduction, except normal dimension when you take the top few pieces. Right? Take the next few pieces. That's not for the PC2 and 3. Hmm. That thing is actually the X and Y coordinate of the PC. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I find it very unintuitive. Like, it, it, because, because Distance is non-linear in the x mm. uh, But, but there's no distance, it's just an angle. Distance is in PC1 already. I, I took, it's already projected out into PC1. Yeah, remember PC1 is distance. Yeah, PC2 so, and 3 is PC2. So, so you can think of it as everyone at unit distance. Because the distance is in PC1. That is not a combination. I think I do it because I need to do it to take it with the exact uh, the exact white polyurethane cells that the linear combination of non-linear factor is not in. Um, I don't know how to uh, how to get that to you. I mean, picture is easier. Like usually, what happens in the case is the, 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 the actual formula for PC2 is the linear variation. It's very, very hard to believe it. Yeah, it's thing about the math. Once you know it's and all that, you know that the formula is the top. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
But of course, you have no idea what to make them the formula is just yet. Like. <coughs> you don't see also the way forward to it. You can see that something like PCA rolls up in. Uh, a lot of people use PCA. You can uh, train, uh, you can learn it like me. You know, in high school, I, I, I learned that. I really learned that. But after that, uh, I learned it the correct way. Then, then I'm much more careful with how I use it. But of course, a lot of people, it, it may not be, it's like half the time is the correct way. <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There are many other alternatives. Yeah. So, what are people using there? Uh, those also have the same kind of issue because most people learn it. They learn the procedure. You know, it's just like uh, actually, my favorite example is statistical test. Uh, uh, even the presentation, you know, you calculate the mean. Do you know what under what situation the mean is meaningful and the under what situation the mean is not meaningful? The mean as a representative of your data requires some assumption on your data. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the point. Okay, so for example, if your, your data distribution, the numbers, is extreme distribution, okay. then you cannot use the mean. Mean is not meaningful representation of that. Okay. So, but how many of you are uh, the top? We can only be applied to the general distribution. Remember, right? Yeah, how many of you were taught to test high school A level? A level? Yeah. So, how many of you were taught what a noun distribution is? And you're normally you taught to test, you're you told to just do the distribution. Yes? But actually, that only works. For some situation, because the now description must have a requirement of that now sample will satisfy that description. But if the now sample don't satisfy that description, you cannot use it. You have to use the alternate distribution that the now sample set. So, a lot of addition to, to do things correctly. You only learn the mechanical aspect, right? never, never really the. Seldom, you're seldom taught. What, what guarantees? You're never taught very seriously what, what to look for before you do those things. Huh? I don't know, I complained to the president of the Royal Society. How do you teach? Well, your textbook teach, uh, teach it this way, but never, never tell people in practice you cannot do it like that. Now, partly because the professor themselves are academics, right? They never try real world well enough to do something that's not really convenient. And they're very excited. Oh, I can push this very particular formula about if it's nice, so it's for. Yeah, yeah. Real world is not like that. So once you see enough real world data, then you realize that yeah, everything will work. Because assumption is not met. Yes. Hmm. Uh, yes and no, because the PCA the variation. It's only variation in the input metrics that you have. Your future data is not that metrics. The future data may have variation that is different. But remember, I say that today I measure tomorrow, I measure it different. That tomorrow has the variation of tomorrow that is not in the not, not, it's not, it's not same as the variation. So my PCA will, will not have. Uh, if, you, if you do it in a very naive way, your model is based on PCA of this training data, then you will not you will not have the variation of the data tomorrow, and you will be I guess, projecting your data from tomorrow into the space of today. Right? 
So if you're lucky that the variation of tomorrow is orthogonal, then you have all odds here. Yeah, but uh, if, if your data of tomorrow has something unique that is relevant, then you also disappear. So then you I think this is a very concrete example. Uh, so if I am measuring, let's say, uh, maybe you don't have the biology, but in biology today, we can measure the profile of every cell in a sample individually. Okay, um, that, that is very good if I want to, let's say, here we are, check for whether someone has cells that are mutated so that you know that. Almost going to become constant. So bio, in biology, the cells, when you mutate, the cell become less competitive. That means that they usually, you know, uh, they cannot grow. They, they will be less competitive. All the other normal cells are very old. The proportion of this size is very small. Until they accumulate enough mutation, it's very funny. So it's very, you have cancer, you require certain mutation that switch up the immune system, that reduce the signal for growth, reduce the signal for ignoring that signal, and so on. So and if you have all this written, then yourself basically can multiply infinitely. Okay? But until you have all the mutation, it is at this one thing. You cannot compete with the normal cell like that. So normal cell would, uh, they say this guy would be very small. So it would be very few of them. So if I want to detect early cancer, I want to detect this kind of cell. But if you do your PCA, this kind of cell, the small, small changes, will usually be protected again. So you will see that. So if, if you don't do, don't, are not careful, uh, then uh, yeah, you, you cannot. The very thing you want to detect that project there. So you can see the CD. No, and you use of the member this um yes, original is like this and projected to PC one and this PC to I throw away and I'll invert that after the PC you, you need to know what to provide them. That's why you see. Yeah, it's, uh, you cannot just apply a procedure blindly. You have to think what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. That logic is very important. Then you get it right. But that is the difference between someone who mechanically apply and an expert that you are going to pay off. You can do that with that difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me yep. here. No Thanks for coming.